All right, thanks for the uh, kind introduction and the opportunity to lecture here. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. Am I loud enough in the back? Yes, no? Okay, nods. Okay, so I was told I should probably start by just asking who here has studied cosmology before, taken a course? Okay, that's a good number. Okay, so um, I will hopefully not assume too much of some background knowledge, but we're gonna go pretty fast through a lot of different topics. And so um, be warned uh, that, you know, I'm not gonna have time to go into details and everything. I'm assuming some prior knowledge. I have some notes that I've uploaded with pictures that I will try to draw on the board, but hopefully most of these pictures are pictures you've seen before, but you can go look in the notes uh, if, you, if you like. So, okay, to um, the start, I'm just gonna outline my plan. Okay, so today, so today we're gonna just talk about just general introduction. So, um, we're gonna, we're gonna discuss Bayesian inference. And then what that means for the CMB and the distribution of stuff in the universe between us and the CMB, which I'm gonna call large scale structure for the purposes of this lecture. Um, then, so my plan for the rest of the talks is then to focus on a few particular interesting targets for particle physicists that we can test with cosmology. And our goal is not to talk about one or the other, the theory or the data, but to talk about how they're related. So I'm assuming many of you have seen big books on cosmology or big books on particle physics or nice Tazzy lectures on all these topics. Um, what I'm hoping to do is fill the gap between those two subjects. So, why, why is it that a certain model is best measured in the CMB? Or why is another model best measured using CMB lensing or large scale structure surveys? So with that in mind, I'm gonna focus on kind of three representative examples. So uh, hopefully tomorrow we're gonna to talk about light relics, which is often encoded in this parameter uh, and effective and how we look for it using cosmic microwave background data. Uh, after that, uh, this is the one that might be on the chopping block if I run out of time, is the sum of the neutrino masses and lensing of the CMB. So gravitational lensing of the cosmic microwave background is the tool which we can use to test for neutrino mass and other properties of light-ish, uh, light but not massless particles. And then in the last lecture, which is the one that I also hope to get to, which is why we would cut this one, we're gonna talk about inflation, primordial non-Gaussianity, and large-scale structure surveys, and here this will mean galaxies in particular. Okay, so that's my plan. Um, does that plan make sense to people? Okay, so when in doubt, this is what I'm trying to do. We'll see if I achieve it, but uh, the notes at least try to do this. And so at the very least, you'll have some written record of my failure to cover all of these topics. Um, okay, so uh, that's the plan. Um, all right, if you looked at the notes and glanced at the first sentence, you will also know that I'm uh, not gonna try to parse words. Uh, I start by declaring that cosmology is the greatest subject in science. It covers all the scales we observe. Um, we, can, we can even think about, starts at the Planck scale, the smallest scale we know, goes out to the cosmological horizon, the biggest scale we know, and it's sensitive to everything in between. And that's the excitement that I want to convey in these lectures, and again, I'm not gonna hold back. You guys have all your own subjects uh, that you care about deeply, and so I will fight for the one I care about in these lectures. Um, okay, so that's the plan. That's what I'm excited about. But what I'm really also excited about is that I started as a theorist and I've now learned how to incorporate data into my theory. And so what I also really want to convey is that the beautiful theory that describes cosmology is also something that we learn by measuring things about the universe. That it's not that cosmology is just relevant to these deep questions about nature on all these scales, but we can learn about physics at the Planck scale. We can learn physics about extremely long distances by actually going and measuring things. And so those are the two things I really want to come through. Okay, so the next question I will have for you is who has heard, okay, I'm gonna write it down and I always misspell it. Who's heard of Bayes' theorem? 
Is this a familiar Bayesian inference? Everyone knows it. Excellent. This is quite a change from my generation. OK, so if I write it on the board, is anyone going to object? Who, who is going to violently object to me repeating it for you? OK, so uh, no, one loves, no one knows it that well. OK, so Bayes' theorem is the statement that the probability of some hypothesis, I'm going to explain what these things are, but I'm just going to write it. So the probability of a hypothesis given the data is equal to the probability of the data given the hypothesis times the probability of the hypothesis divided by the probability of the data. OK, this seems like an obvious statement just by looking at variables and seeing how they're interchanged. Yet I struggled for a long time to actually understand what each of these things means. And there's a reason I'm writing this on the board, which I'm going to explain in a second, which is why it's so important to cosmology. So we're going to take a second. I know you've all seen it before. But to really digest what each one of these things is doing, because it's going to teach us really important lessons about how we think about the universe. So why is it important to think about Bayes' theorem? Well, first and foremost, we only have one universe. So what Bayes' theorem is, is really about is just saying, how can we learn, given what we know, how confident I am in what I can see? Now, from an experimentalist point of view, you build your confidence by just repeating experiments until you're so convinced it couldn't have been anything else. But cosmologists, we have one universe. We don't get to rerun the universe with different parameters. We don't get to try different things. And so we have to live with this as the way we decide, uh, we assign confidence to what we know about the history of the universe. The second thing, which is maybe something you've covered, but is special to cosmology, is that cosmology is really a measurement of noise. So cosmology is about measuring noise. Now, that sounds really boring, um, but it's actually quite literally true. So have you, I assume you've all seen a picture of the cosmic microwave background. So you've probably seen a sphere. I'll put, some, I'll put some colors on it so it'll look kind of like what you've seen. So there's probably some, some blue and red. Let's get it up there. OK, so you've seen this picture, I assume. It's like some, some dots. There's some red dots that are kind of all over, and they're like this. Everyone's seen this picture? OK, yes, everyone's seen this picture. OK, so this picture is a picture of sound waves. Right? So it's, it's quite literally noise. They're random sound waves, the same way that if you went into a room and it was just really annoyingly buzzing, you would call that a bunch of noise. So what we measure is literally noise. So it's just our measurement of the CMB is noise. This is just a bunch of noise that, we're looking, that was made at a redshift of approximately 1,100. Um, we're just seeing a picture of that noise on the sky. By the way, people know what I mean by redshift? I probably should have defined variables to start. Okay, so um, I'll come back to that in a second when we get a little bit further than, than Bayes' theorem. Um, okay, so our problem is we're measuring a bunch of noise, and what we want to do is learn about properties of the noise. And so it's kind of a weird thing to be like, I'm measuring noise, but my noise is also my signal. And so that's why I want to focus on Bayes' theorem, because what we talk about in cosmology is really analogous to other situations where Bayes' theorem is kind of a little bit more obvious, but that it's, we're trying to learn a property of something that's itself random. We're not separating signal and noise. We're measuring noise, and we just want to know its properties. OK, so the example that kind of most articulates this is coin flipping. OK? So we're given a coin. OK, it's, um, I'm not going to try to draw a good picture, but there's like a face, and then there's like a tail. It's, I'm Canadian, so I'll put the beaver on the back um, for the, 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 the tail. OK, and there's some kind of face. I'll just make it a smiley face, because that's my drawing ability. OK, so there's a heads and there's a tails. And we get heads with probability p, and we get tails with probability 1 minus p. OK? We don't know that it's a fair coin. I mean, this picture is slightly different than the other one. It could make it a little bit lopsided. I might get hails more often than I get tails. Now, the question, so there's some fundamental value to this p. The, the coin has some probability p for heads, probably 1 minus p for tails. We, on the other hand, don't know that. We, all we get to do is flip the coin. So what we are trying to do is we're going to flip the coin. So we're going to flip the coin and 
n times. And we're going to try to figure out what p is. And we're going to give our and we're going to use this to determine uh, our best guess of what p is. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to get a probability of p given n flips of the data. The n flips of our coin. Now it's not quite n flips, so I should really have erased that. What, what we really have is n flips with little n. Let's say these are the number of heads. This is the number of heads that we get after flipping the coin n times. Number of flips. So we want to assign some probability distribution for the possible values of this p. We can never know it exactly. It's a property of the coin, but no one, gets, no one tells us what it is. We just get to figure out how well we can learn what this p is given the data we have, which is flipping the coin n times. Okay? And so in this sense, this is a random process like noise, and we're trying to learn a property of the noise. What is the probability distribution that that noise is being drawn from? Okay, does that make sense as, as the, the strategy? Okay, so this is what we want to know. Now we know we're going to apply Bayes' theorem. Okay, so okay, so we have we're trying to learn this probability given. Okay, so the first thing we need to know is the likelihood. So the likelihood is the probability of getting this given a particular p. Okay, so this piece here is called the likelihood. Okay, it's the probability, and then I'll just for now, just we're gonna remember that we have this over here. Okay, so the likelihood is the thing that you actually have to calculate. That's the where all the interesting stuff is. This will turn this is just there for uh, you know dotting i's and crossing t's. But this is really where our knowledge comes from. OK, so calculating this quantity, this is something we know how to do. We're given a, we, we take a fixed p that we're guessing. That's our hypothesis. Our hypothesis is, let's say we flip it just for a reference. Let's say we have n equals 1,000, and we get little n equals 550. OK? And we want to try to figure out what possible p is consistent with this. Um, so, for example, you could say, well, I still think it's a fair coin. What is the probability that a fair coin produced this outcome? Um, okay, so now that I've written the example, I want to take a show of hands. Who thinks that this is consistent with a fair coin at two sigma? Any intuition for that? Everyone, okay, so who thinks that this is a reasonable outcome of a fair, of a fair coin? Like 5% of the time would produce a fair coin and produce that. Okay, who thinks, who thinks that this is definitely, let's say, greater than, than two sigma would be a fair coin? Unlikely to be a fair coin. Unlikely to be a fair coin. I got a few brave souls betting on the not fair coin. Okay, or they looked at the notes. Um, okay, so, uh, okay, so with that in mind, we go and we calculate this likelihood. Okay, so who, who wants to remind me what the formula would be for this quantity? So. Given a p, what is the probability of generating little n heads? Anyone want to venture, or should I just write it down? p to the little n, 1 minus p. Sorry, you have a statement up front. I'm just repeating. 1 minus p to the capital N minus little n. So number of heads to the p, number uh, n minus, 1 minus p does number times to the number of tails. So probability of heads to the n, probability of tails to the, the capital N minus little n. And then what did I miss? OK, and then n choose n because, they're, because I didn't care about the order. So I fundamentally assumed I don't care if, they all, if all my heads came first and they all, then I got all tails last. I'm, I have many possible ways I could have ended up at this configuration. We'll see in one second that we actually don't care about this factor, but just for completeness, we have to include this because this is the probability of, ca of getting, um, getting that number of heads. Okay, now I totally misjudged these boards because I was supposed to pull down the middle one. Uh, okay, sorry about that. I should have been planning ahead. Okay, we'll just move over to the next board so I can leave that up there. Okay, so these middle boards. Okay. 
sorry, I'm learning about these boards. Um, okay, so the next step, so that's the probability of the data given the model. Now we have two things left. So the first, the prior, this is our prior, okay. This is our belief in P ahead of time. So this is what we think P is, okay. So without knowing any data. So we haven't flipped the coin at all. Okay, so we've presumably seen both sides of the coin. If, so we know that it's probably not both heads. So it's probably not probability one that it's at one or zero. But we want the data to decide the answer. So usually we take these priors to be pretty soft because we're trying to let the data tell us what's true about the universe, not to put it in as a prior belief. However, the prior can also be useful because we could put in experimental data we already have as a prior. So let's say you flipped 100 times yesterday, and I want to flip it 100 times today. Well, I could just put in my, prior, my information from yesterday as a prior. That's what I already have. So it's not, it's not useless to think of the prior as a piece of information that we can add in a meaningful way. But usually when you see a presentation of Bayes' theorem, you say, well, we want to be pretty, we want to be pretty agnostic about this. So we're going to take this to be a flat distribution. So just a uniform distribution between zero and one, because we're trying just trying not to let the we're trying to let the data speak for itself. Okay, so the last piece, which is the one I always that seems the most confusing, is the probability of the data. Okay, so who can tell me what the the role of the probability of the data is in life? What is a why does this exist? Why do I have to put this in the base theorem? Yes, correct. So that's all it is. It's just there. It's a constant. So notice this doesn't depend on p at all. It's just an overall constant. So I have a curve that's going to have some shape. Given a flat prior, then this curve's shape will be completely determined by the function here from the likelihood. This has no information about p. This is independent of p. Which is, so it's independent of the hypothesis, which in this case is p. OK, so that tells us that all we need to do, we don't have to have any fancy definition for p of d. All p of d is there to do is to make a normalized probability distribution. So all we do is we say, OK, well, how do I make a normalized probability distribution? I just take whatever the non-normalized thing is and divide by it. So, I, so the, this is just equal to the integral over the um, likelihood times the prior. And this is going to give us some number, OK? Yep. Oh, OK. Let me start. Let me start here. I'll, I'll re, I should re-enable this. This is our. This is the true value. So I'll say, tilde p is the true value. And now this is our belief. This is our guess. So so I'll use from here on out. I'll use p tilde tilde to be the actual true fundamental value, and our guess of what the true fundamental value is is the p with no tilde on it. And so here, every, every future p is our hypothesis. So p here is playing the role of h. I've just made it a specific parameter. Does that, does that help? Oh, that's a probability of little p, sorry. OK, and what does that mean that it's the prior? So that's, our pro, that's a probability distribution we make up. What is the probability that the coin is actually has some particular value of p? So if I'm very strong, have a strong belief it's fair, like I believe the government made coins that are fair for some reason, then I might put a very strong prior, very peaked at one half. So, then, but then this is my prior belief. So I, my prior belief influences what my belief is after taking the data. So I go into the, the situation saying I'm very sure that this is a fair coin. And if I'm so sure, then the data can't change my opinion very much. So I tend to, we tend to not want to put very strong conditions here because we want the data to determine. We want the data to determine our posterior, the, the our, our probability distribution for p, not the prior. So the prior sits here. Sorry, the prior sits here. This is our prior. So our prior sits here. This is our likelihood. This is the real theory happened here. 
And so what we want is the theory, our, our model, to decide what, what we learn about the universe and not this prior, which is my belief that the government is uh, interested in whether it has a fair coin. So the MVP is then properly... Is the data. Is the data. So, sorry, I should have written this here as n, little n, but independent of the hypothesis. So, but this thing, again, this thing is a constant independent of the hypothesis, so just a number. For your point of view, it's a number. And so we're defining that number just to get a normalized distribution. So if I just, I think of the part without the P of D as being a not properly normalized probability, then all I do is integrate it. It's a number that's not one, and then I divide out, and then the integral of the quantity will be one. Does, does that make sense to people? Yeah. It's a probability of the data. It, ha it even has another name. Yes, it's just a constant. Don't, don't, that's why it's confusing, because it seems like it's some, it's, so if you think about it this way, it's the probability of the data given all possible hypotheses. And so you're integrating over all possible hypotheses. The reason it's the probability of the data is because the data itself had some, like, the data is some possibility. Like, before you took the data, it could have been anything. So now it's something, so it has some, there was some probability with something. And so we've just said, what's the probability of something given all possible hypotheses that could have led to it? So it's like a marginalized probability of the data. Does that make sense? OK. OK, any more questions? Yeah. Um, the point that you were just making about the priors is something I've always been confused about in Bayesian statistics. Um, why would you want your prior knowledge to have any influence? On so, so we're going to see a really useful example where we put priors in, and that's where, like, so let's say I'm analyzing cosmic microwave background data. But I want to incorporate knowledge from, let's say, measurements of primordial abundances in stars. Okay, I don't want to have to analyze all of that data together, because analyzing data from stars is annoying. And, but it gives me some answer. It gives me some, some probability distribution for some parameters. And if all I need out of that star data is the probability of the parameters, I just put it as a prior. So that's. That, that's the, the reason it can be useful to put something pretty constraining there. The other reason to make it explicit is that this choice is a coordinate dependent statement. So I said this is flat, I said it's one, but that's because I chose the variable p. Like if I chose p squared instead, then this thing is not flat. So people do put these in to, to, as a way of saying, as to be explicit that there's still some choice of how you put volumes on your space of models that influences your answer. So one thing you can do is change this slightly, say change your prior, to see how it affects your answers and it's sensitive to how you do that. So for example, a common thing that happens in cosmology is that people might put a log, they might think log of something is the right uh, pr the right way to measure something. So for a cross section, a cross section could vary by orders of magnitude. So we want to be uniform in log. Where somebody else might say, well, I think the cross section would be literally zero, so I want it to be, I don't want the probability of being zero. Like, I want to allow that as a possibility. And those two things are very different. And they actually lead to different shape likelihoods for the final answer. So we put it here just to be explicit, not just throw it away. So we know what we're doing. Does that make sense? Okay, other questions? OK, so let's continue with this example. Um, OK, I have this up on the board. But you'll notice, you'll notice that this n choose n is going to appear here and here. So I could just write it as n choose little n times the number. And you'll see that they cancel. So there will be some number and then just this two, these two quantities that define the, the shape. So again, had I been better about my board use, we wouldn't be in this situation. But OK, we're going to jump to the answer. So OK, so here is my probability given the data is going to be times some number. OK? That's, my, that's the shape of this function. Now this, we can occasionally, it's, so we're going to work in the limit where our n is pretty big, but we can always write this as a constant times an exponential of n log p plus n minus n log 1 minus p. OK, I haven't done anything very interesting. Now, another thing that's useful to define is to define p bar. 
uh, as just the ratio of little n to big n. So this is our, you might say this is our best guess for what, P what, what the probability is. Um, because we're just saying if this is, I just take the number of heads, divide by the total, that's the fraction of heads, so maybe that's the probability. You might have the intuition that as n goes to infinity, this should be the right answer. Okay, but writing it that way, then I can just factor out an overall capital N. So I can write it this way, big N times P bar log P plus one minus P bar log one minus P. Okay. Now, this, the key thing I want you to take away from this is that this overall n factors out front. So there's multiple ways you could think about it. We could just think we could do this for one coin. And since every flip is independent, we just add them all up. And so, so things multiply in probabilities. So they just add inside of the exponential. They come out front. But we'll see the consequence in one second. Um, so the first thing to do, in the interest of time, I'll just tell you the answers. You can work it out. Uh, so the first thing we, we can do is uh, find the maximum. So the maximum of this thing is where the derivative of p is equal to 0. So I'm going to evaluate this at some p naught, which I'm going to call this is the maximum of this is the maximum uh, probability, the maximum of the probability. So it's the most likely value of p. Now, it presumably will come as no surprise that p naught is equal to p bar. So you just solve the equation. You take one derivative. You set it to 0. You solve it. It's not super shocking um, that, that that's going to be your answer. OK, so the next thing we want to do is we want to we find out the shape around this point. So our likelihood is something like this. So there's 0, 1. It's some shape like this. The maximum here is at p bar. The next question we want to know is what is the width of this distribution? So by the central limit theorem, this thing is going to become a Gaussian. In the notes, we show that it's a Gaussian, so you don't have to take a theorem uh, for it. It just comes from Taylor expansion. So we're just going to Taylor expand this exponential. We know that the first term, the linear term, is 0 around the maximum. So the next term is the quadratic term. That's the thing that makes it look like a Gaussian. OK, so we continue on. And we find that, so now if we expand out, so let's expand. That's right, p is equal to p bar plus some delta p. We're going to expand around this middle point. If we expand out, we're going to get that the probability of p, let's, we can now write it as delta p given these two things, is the exponential of of, so now it's going to be minus n will be equal to, so we're going to get 1 over p's, so we're going to get, we're going to get a minus 1 over p squared and then a p upstairs, so we're going to get a 1 over p bar from the first term, and we're going to get a 1 over 1 minus p bar from the second term, and these two things give us times delta p squared. So this is just Taylor expansion. This is just Taylor expanding. And so we can write this as this is a Gaussian in P where this sigma here is set by this combination. Sorry, I ran out of, I made a poor use of space. So this is Taylor here. This is Taylor where sigma squared you can see we'll have a 1 over n in it, right? The, the main thing here is the 1 over n. So there's a 1 over n. So it will, and, and some details we don't necessarily care about divided by 1 over n. Okay, so the variance is set by some facts about the, the, the average p we got out or the maximum of the likelihood. Not super sensitive. This function is pretty flat. But the key 
that the whole point of this exercise is the 1 over n. So remember, this is the variance, so that means the error bars go like 1 over the square root of n. Okay, so literally, if you remember nothing from what we just did, is all you need to know, the whole point of this, is that error bars go like 1 over the square root of the number of times you sampled something. This is a probability of, this is a property of coin flipping, but coin flipping is just a special case of a random walk or random sampling data. Because of the central limit theorem, it doesn't actually matter what the model is. Anything that's just drawing random numbers will always converge to something that goes like some tiny details of the model divided by the number of times you sampled. Yep? Uh, so with the coin flipping, we have two possibilities that entails. Can you do this if you don't know your possibilities, or do you have some? You could do this if you did this with just drawing Gaussian numbers from a Gaussian distribution and you wanted to ask what is the variance of my Gaussian distribution, then it would have exactly the same prob prob problem. Like it would literally converge to the same thing. The deep, this thing up here would be like the variance of the model itself, and the thing downstairs would be one over n. How many times you drew a random number from the distribution? Okay, so this, so this was the first takeaway. The second takeaway, which I will just write because it's, you're going to see formulas later that look like this. Um, okay, maybe I'll first ask, who has heard of a Fisher matrix? Okay, not everyone, but a decent number. So, all of that business of writing out the exponential and Taylor expanding to read off the quadratic term, we could have replaced with the following exercise. We could have just calculated two derivatives of minus the log of the probability of the hypothesis given the data. And this would have just been, and then evaluated at the maximum. And that would have been 1 over sigma squared. Okay? That's. You know, if everything becomes a Gaussian at some point, then this is just the statement that if I take two derivatives of, a, of the log of a Gaussian, it's the same as the variance. Now, the reason this is important is that if I have more than one parameter, so imagine I replace this instead of being a, instead of this being a coin with one number I have to measure, let's say it's a die. I have like six numbers I need to know. Then this is generalized to a matrix where we take derivatives with respect to all of those numbers of the log of this thing minus the, minus the log of the probability of all of these numbers given the data. And this thing is going to be the Fisher matrix. And inverting the Fisher matrix gives us the error bars. So the inverse is equal to the error bar of a given parameter. So again, you could get this from Taylor expanding. When we bring it up later, you could get it from Taylor expanding. There's really no, I mean, there's some nice theorems about the Fisher matrix that use actually sophisticated techniques. But in general, you just think of everything we're going to do about how much information there is in the universe is going to basically boil down to something that looks like a Gaussian and Taylor expanding it around, say, the best fit point. Um, OK, so that's. So those are kind of the lessons I want you to take away. So were there questions so far? OK, so to reiterate, the reason we care about this is because the error bars go like 1 over the square root of n. We're going to measure different properties of the universe, n of them, where n is going to be a thing that depends on the survey. And our goal is to understand how those numbers depend on you know, how good our data is. And it will always just boil down to we get better measurements by measuring more stuff. Measuring stuff, but it only goes like the square root of the amount of stuff. So if you want to do better by a factor of 10, you have to measure 100 times more stuff. So that's the key takeaway from the cosmologist's point of view. Um, OK, so what does this tell us about, uh, about cosmology? OK, so maybe here is where I will pause and fill in my definitions. Um, just so we're all on the same page in terms of notation. OK, so just some quick definitions. So when in doubt, we're talking about it. We're always talking about an FRW cosmology. That's going to mean that the metric takes 
this hopefully familiar form where this quantity here, A of t, is the scale factor. The important thing to remember is that physical distances are a combination of A and X, or in the case of a Fourier transform. So if we Fourier transform, this is, we're going to Fourier transform so much, I'm just going to say it up front, that K over A is the physical wave number. Okay, so waves get stretched by the expansion of the universe. So if you want to talk about a physical length scale, it always comes in the form K over A. So when in doubt, if you're confused about something, check what happened to the A's. The A should always be consistent. There shouldn't be an A here and an A somewhere else when they're both length scales. So if I had like, if I had an equation that's like D is equal to L over A, and both of them are supposed to be physical wave, this is supposed to be a physical distance, and this is a physical distance, you messed up your factors of A, okay? That's the rule of thumb when doing cosmology. Unfortunately, we also like to pick weird variables where we factored out a bunch of A's, and so it's sometimes hard to keep track of. And that's exactly why uh, you mostly just have to check that it's consistent across the equation. OK, the next thing, redshift. So the, if I want to measure how much a line has moved, so I measure hydrogen uh, at some distant point, the amount that it's moved is usually talked about in terms of the redshift. So that would say if I'm measuring, so the way in which that's related to the scale factor is that if I measure light coming from some galaxy and I think it's at a scale, a time, T measured is where it came from and the scale factor was T measured, then the amount at which it was redshifted is one plus Z where Z is this thing we call the redshift, which is how far a line moved from where it's supposed to be. Now, if we simply define, we're always allowed to define T today, A to be one, okay? We're just gonna define physical distances to be coordinate distances today, and then we just keep a track of what happened in the past. In that case, then I can just use this equation to say A, the, the relationship between scale factor and redshift is just one over one plus z. So redshift of 1,000 means the scale factor is one over 1,000 plus one, okay? So 10 to the minus three scale factor is the same as redshift of 1,000. Again, we astronomers like redshift. I don't know what I am, so I use both. And so you're just gonna have to use, go back and forth from time to time. Okay, um, I'll bring up the other ones later. There's some definitions at the top of the notes for perturbations, um, but for now I think this is sufficient to get us going. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk about the CMB. Oh, let's get the middle one, it's nice and clean, okay. Okay, so I drew that beautiful picture of the sphere and the dots, and you're just blown away by how amazing this, we can measure such an amazing image um, and ignored my terrible drawing. And so what, but what we want to understand is what does that image really tell us, okay? So usually what we do, so there's some language where we have this map, we have stuff in the sky, okay, and we, so often what you'll see is a conversion of this map into spherical harmonics. So the first thing you do is you say this is T on the sky and I'm going to write it as a sum over spherical harmonics. Like so, okay? So this is just a decomposition. There's no interesting physics here. I just converted um, I've converted the map on the sky into the sort of analog of the Fourier transform on the sphere. Now, a thing that will be useful is that we'll often think about what's happening in like a small patch of the sky, because when we're thinking about really, we're, we're thinking about short distance physics that gives rise to this picture, what, what we'll often be, be thinking of is like really small angular scales. In that case, it's much easier to just think of what's going on as being the Fourier transform. So if I just take a little pit, patch of the sky sufficiently small compared to the whole sky, I don't have to do YLMs, I can just Fourier transform that patch of the sky. So roughly speaking, when 
the, when, when this L is sufficiently large, then you can think of the relationship between this L, which is just a number, one, two, three, up to thousands, is the same as the Fourier transform. So this is uh, one over distance. So this is the Fourier, this is, this is the length of the Fourier mode. Here I'm using the notation that the length of a vector is just the one without the arrow. So this is like a length because there's this L, this M variable that counts all the possible for the spherical harmonics. And then, so this has no units. This has units of one over distance. So I better multiply it by a distance. And this is the distance to the last scattering surface, to the CMB, okay? So how physically far away the CMB is from us. So that's a relationship between Fourier transforms and spherical harmonics. Okay, this will just be useful because a lot of times I'm just going to do the Fourier transform because we know Fourier transform math a lot more than, I don't know if anyone likes Wigner's 3J symbols. I hate them, so I'm not going to use them. And so that's why we're going to often talk about Fourier transforms. Okay, I don't hate them, but they're just annoying. Um, so I didn't mean to offend any, any fans out there. Um, okay, so. <laughs> But because on the size of the sphere, I mean, it really matters. It's not the portrait. I mean, the geometry of a sphere actually matters at L of 1 and 2 and 5. So it's just when, when we're talking, OK, so it is a somewhat counterintuitive thing because we're in Fourier space, right? High k, high L corresponds to small angular distances. But yes, all of them live on the whole sphere. So it, but it, it, it works. And you, it, uh, there's a specific, um, it's a property of Bessel functions that you can work out that gives you this exact result if you're not sure. Um, OK, so now the thing that's often done is you, okay, so you take, you take this, um, this information, this spherical decomposition, or you can do it in terms of Fourier modes, and you calculate the average, let's say, let's write it this way. I'm going to average over m and then divide by the number of m's, which is 2l plus 1. And I'm going to call that cl, OK? So here, I'll put the complex conjugate because I forgot it. OK, so what is this? This is just a measure of how big the fluctuations are in a given spherical harmonic. So the, if we think of this, this is like the power spectrum in k. So our expectation is that the power on the sky cares about angular scale. So it cares about how big or small something is, but it doesn't care which specific, specific spherical harmonic it is. So it doesn't care that m is 3 or 5 or 2. That doesn't matter. What it cares about, so we're going to average over all the different m's because we're going to guess that there's some information encoded in this random, these random numbers if we add them up. So think of this as being like the variance of a distribution. But now that variance, we're going to keep the fact that it, there's an L dependence. So it could depend on scale. So we're drawing a bunch of random numbers, but those random numbers depend on scale. Now, you will probably have seen this, the plot of this quantity. So how many of you have seen a plot that looks like that? That looks familiar? OK. It's probably pretty close. I mean, it's not that far off if you've seen it. Um, OK, so technically, this is CL times L times L plus 1. That's the way people often plot it, is with an extra L times L plus 1 there. That's the one that will give you this shape. If you don't put it like that, it won't look quite the same. Now, OK, so this is the plot. OK, the key thing I want you to notice is the wiggles. OK, so there are a bunch of wiggles on this plot. Now, I'm sure you've all taken it for granted that there are wiggles on this plot and thought nothing of it, because like, well, why shouldn't there be wiggles? I like functions that have wiggles, and this is a nice function. So the question you should ask is, what, what did we already learn from the measurement of the wiggles of this plot? Now, I should say, the second thing before we go on to what that actually tells us is that if I'm to put error bars on this plot, so you'll notice if you've ever seen this plot that the error bars go something like this, and they get really small. I'm going to put like an L of 1500 here. So they get, about, they get really small to the point you can't see them here, and then they get bigger again, something like this, OK? Up until about here. So on this side, 
these air bars are going like the, the, the size of this air bar, this is just one over the square root of the number of spherical harmonics. So the number of m's, which is the same as one over square root of 2L plus 1. Okay? These are cosmic variance error bars. That's the name for it. That's just our coin flipping. They're just saying, look, there's only, you know, there's only a few spherical harmonics at low L, right? So I have, I've decomposed this into spherical harmonics, but this thing runs from minus L to L. If L is four, then I'm not really running over enough numbers to really push down how well I know this. I think it's some random quantity, so my measurement of a random quantity only gets better by the number of times I measure it. So it follows that pattern until about here. So over here, this is just cosmic variance. This is just cos... Uh, cos Variance. This is just coin flipping. This is nothing more than coin flipping, okay? It's just the in inherent fact that we're measuring noise. Over here, this is actually experimental details, okay? So now there's actual experimental, experimental noise that enters. There's actually stuff that's going to be in between us and the CMB. So the fact that these error bars get bigger again, that's stuff we'll talk about later. That's more complicated. Yep. Follow spherical harmonics on very small scales? Um, well, they, they follow spherical harmonics because there's a sphere, the sky is a sphere, and we can always decompose anything. I can put a dog on the surface of the sky and decompose some spherical mm -hmm. harmonics. Now, the question that you're also asking is why is this a good way to decompose? And the reason is in Fourier space, it will be more obvious is that um, the, the universe. Uh, we can think of it as being flat and evolving in time. And because it's flat, it has translation invariance, which means that Fourier modes are conserved. So roughly speaking, that, that uh, there's the, the statistical properties have some nice uh, behavior in L and M or in K, vector K. Now, so the sum of K is zero for a correlation function. Now, that's an assumption we put in when we analyze the data. And lots of people question whether we know that's true. And they'll analyze the data in different ways, not decomposing in spherical harmonics to test that hypothesis. Is that it? Yeah, and then just a related question. Um, so L is kind of the angular distance on the sky. What is M? M is just the, all of the different. So if you remember the hydro, like the, your, your different uh, properties of atoms, right? You have your like, as you go up in P, Q, like there's the orientation like this and this and this. They're just different orientations of the same shape. So there's like some pattern and then you have to sum over all possible ways you could orient the pattern. Okay, so, okay, so this is what we measure. The key I want to emphasize is if you go and look at these plots, almost all of these wiggles are much bigger than the error bars. So there's no doubt that we're definitely measuring wiggles and it's not a property of noise. Okay, so now what do those wiggles tell us? Okay, so to, to get there, let's talk about what the CMB, what we're, what we're measuring again. So I told you we're measuring sound, okay? So the, the early universe is, is made up of a pot plasma of electrons, protons, and photons. So there's basically, the, there's some dark matter too. So I'll draw the picture. I'm going to draw it multiple times. There's some dark matter. There's some neutrinos. We're not going to worry about those, those yet. There's some gravity in the middle. But then there's these three things. There's the photons, there's the electrons, and then there's the protons. These things all interact with each other. So the photons, here I'll draw arrows. So the photons and the electrons scatter. So this is Compton. And then there's just the Coulomb law that keeps the electrons and protons in the same place. You don't have charge separating in the universe. Charges like to stay together. So there's Coulomb. Where's the... Okay. So all of these three things are tightly coupled together. So these things all form a single fluid. This forms a fluid that in the characteristic astronomer sense is called the photon baryon fluid. Presumably, in the same sense that astronomers call metals anything heavier than helium, these are all the baryons. So, okay, so this is, the, this is a fluid. Um, it behaves, it really behaves like a sound, so, so this, there's sound waves in this fluid, and the sound waves travel at a speed set by how much, uh, how much energy is in the protons and electrons compared to how much energy is in the photons. 
Um, OK, and so the sound waves, that's usually given by this expression. The speed of propagation of a relativistic fluid is given by 1 over 3 times 1 plus the fraction of energy in baryons. So this evolves in time because the photon's di energy dilutes at a different rate than baryons. But does anyone remember how many photons there are per baryon? You probably covered this in baryogenesis. 10 to the minus 5, any other numbers? 10 to the 10. So the answer is there's lots of 5s and 10s. So there's an also 10 to the, there's some 10 to the 9s and 10 to the 10s are going to come up that have nothing to do with this one. But there are just a lot more photons. And so this number is going to be much less than 1. Okay? The, the things travel basically at the speed, 1 over the square root of the speed of light. A second interesting consequence of the fact that there's a lot more photons. So I'm going to just write this here. This is approximately one third. Okay, that fact is going to be really important later, which is why I'm emphasizing it now. Okay, another interesting fact about the fact that about an, another important consequence of how many photons there are is that that explains why the CMB temperature, the when the photons. Okay, I'm, I'm jumping ahead. So this is what the story. Sorry, I'm going to back up. This is the story until an era known as recombination. Um, have, did anyone mention that so far in these lectures? So far, recombination, a word familiar to people? Yes, no, yes, okay, some of you. Okay, so recombination, again, I'm sorry to, to, to make fun of astronomers, but it's in one of those great words where the re refers to the first time something has ever happened. <laughs> so it's kind of, it should just be called combination. Okay, so recombination is the first time hydrogen forms. So, was, Oh, the one. Yep, yeah, thanks. Okay, so, so hydrogen forms, and we'll just call this time t star. Okay, this is recombination. It's called recombination. Okay, and so what happens at recombination is that now the protons, now you don't have free electrons. Okay, so the photons can't scatter off of the electrons anymore. And so basically you just have photons and then electrons and protons, and they go off and do their separate thing. So now this looks like matter. There's no, all the pressure that supports the sound waves comes from the photons. So there's no motion of the electrons and protons without the photons to push them along. And the photons can't behave like a fluid unless they're scattering off of anything. And they can't scatter off anything if there's no free electrons. So this just free streams. Okay, there's no, to first approximation, it doesn't scatter anymore. Now, the temperature where this happens, which I'm going to call capital T star, is approximately 0 0.2 electron volts. Now, that should be a surprising number to you at first sight because the binding energy of hydrogen is 13.6 electron volts, and this is a much smaller number than 13.6. Uh, That's because there are so many photons, right? You only need one out of 10 to the 10 photons to have energy above 13 eV to keep ionizing the, the, to keep ionizing the hydrogen. So roughly speaking, the Planck distribution might look something like this, where all this is down at 0 0.2, but all I need is enough of these 13.6 eV photons to keep the hydrogen ionized. So if you just go and do a back of the envelope estimate of when that happens, you get about half an eV. So roughly speaking, this transition is just when this tail of the, the distribution is sufficiently weak that you can't even find enough photons to keep ionizing the hydrogen. OK, so what happens after that is that we just basically get a snapshot of the photons. So the photons basically suddenly stop scattering. They come straight to us, more or less undisturbed. Um, they might occasionally scatter off of an electron after the universe reionizes, and that's actually a correct use of re or by gravitational lensing, because it's a little bit bent along the line of sight. But the first approximation, what we're seeing is just a snapshot of the universe at this moment, T star. OK, so what is happening at the universe at that moment is you have a bunch of sound waves. So we have, we just have different Fourier modes bouncing around. So roughly speaking, we'll just call the, the local temperature of photons, 
this is like the uh, as a function of time. This is the local temperature of the photons. This obeys something it looks like. So this is a proxy for the density of the photons. The, the density of the photons is like a sound wave. There's pressure waves traveling through this fluid. So roughly speaking, it obeys uh, something that looks like a wave equation. And there's some stuff on the right-hand side. There's some gravity. And there's, like a, there's some extra terms here that we'll talk about later. But to first approximation, there's just sound. Okay. So the sound waves are bouncing around. Okay. Now, your first guess would be, okay, so this was maybe not your first guess because you've learned a lot of physics, but like the first guess of somebody imagining what would the CMB look like, they would say, well, okay, the, there's probably a bunch of sound waves sourced by just something. Okay. When I'm in a room, there's just a bunch of random sound. Okay, I would guess that it's just, if it just sounds like white noise, it probably is white noise. And so your guess might be that the, your guess might be that they just follow from a random distribution. Okay, so you'd guess, okay, so I have my temperature, I'm gonna Fourier transform now. So I'm just gonna transform the Fourier, so I'm gonna take by Fourier transform. And I'm going to guess that this is drawn, actually, I'm going to use capital A to not be confusing. So I might guess that this is just the solutions to the wave equation in Fourier space with some, with some coefficients A and B. Okay, And I guess that these coefficients A and B are are totally random numbers. So we'll guess, let's say they're drawn from a Gaussian. So you're, let's say that there's two ways of, draw, of thinking this. I'll draw the first one to be the, is, is to say that they're totally independent. So let's say I'm going to write it like this. And then the fact that the universe has translation invariance tells us that there's this delta function. Oh, and I forgot my two pi's. And I, could, and I would guess the same is true for the bees. They'll have their own power spectrum. And then there's some cross-correlation coefficient. Which is how correlated A and B are. Sorry, I'm going to put this back. Uh, I'm going to make my life easy for now on. So I've defined this is this times the delta function. So I can stop writing pi's and sums of momenta. OK. So a priori, it's, this is, I put no information in. I've just said, so so far, I've just said these are random variables. And these are the property, these are the things that characterize those random variables that are consistent with the fact that the universe looks the same everywhere, so it's homogeneous and isotropic. It looks the same in every direction. No preferred directions, no preferred locations. Okay, now you might guess, I'm just in a room mixing up sound waves. Something's buzzing in the background, I don't know. It's just kind of randomly coming out. There's no, a priori, there's no reason to prefer A over B. And so you might guess the following, I, your guess might be that P A, and let's say they're uncorrelated. So they're both random, they're uncorrelated. Now this is equivalent to assuming that it's, I could also always turn the sine into a cosine and a phase. This is equivalent to assuming that the phase is a uniform distribution between 0 and 2 pi that's uncorrelated with the amplitude. Okay, so is it, is it clear what I'm assuming, I'm guessing about the nature of these sound waves? Are there any questions? Okay, so I'm just filling the universe totally randomly with sound waves, random amplitude, random phase. Um, 
and I'm a, so that the sines and cosines are not special. Okay, if we do this and we calculate, so remember I said I was going to stop using L's whenever I had to calculate anything. So if we calculate the temperature, this is, we calculate this, our recombination. So this quantity here, this is like our CL. This is our CL of temperature. Okay, this was that picture with the wiggles. Well, we had a rule for that up here. So if I put in this guess, which is the natural guess, I mean, why would there be a preference for one or the other, you would get cosine squared CS KT star plus Oops, this in a weird way. Time squared of CSK T star. Now if I assume that these things are equal amplitude, I can just use the trig identity. B is equal to A. So I get to erase this and put a bracket here. Then I use the trig identity. Cosine plus sine squared is equal to 1. I erase the whole thing. I guess get P of K. Now, if we were even guessing that this is some kind of local phenomena, you would have guessed that P of K is some analytic function of K. It's one plus K squared plus K to the fourth, right? Something that tra Fourier transforms to a bunch of delta functions, local physics. This definitely is not equal to the wiggles, right? We Oh, wiggles, cosines and sines, but the wiggles are gone if I assume that they're just random sources of noise. In fact, observations suggest the following. Observations, so what we know is that observationally, P of A of K is just what we call the primordial power spectrum. P of B of K is equal to zero, and C of A and B is also equal to zero. There's no sines in the universe. There's only cosines. Okay, who thinks that's totally normal and not surprised at all by that fact? Okay. I was hoping someone would be brave, but okay, yes. So this is not intuitive from local physics. Does somebody know the answer to this puzzle? Why are there only cosines in the universe? Okay, well, what is it, so what does that tell us? What, where, what, what is the, why, why is one from, what is that, what did we learn about the universe in the process of the fact that it's only cosines? So the words you're saying are correct, but what is that, but, but, but that's, uh, there's some assumption built into that statement that, that I must have broken. So what assumption are you making that I wasn't making? So there's no, okay, nope, but, but thanks for the guess. Any more guesses, yes? Inhomogeneous. Inhomogeneous, okay, so the answer to this, so, so no one has said the magic words uh, of, uh, well, no one, no one threw out inflation, but inflation is not, is, is a solution to the problem we've encountered. So this is itself just an incarnation of what's called the, um, uh, I guess it's the homogeneity and isotropy problem. It's the horizon problem of that inflation is meant to solve. But what it tells us is that the fluctuations weren't created during the hot big bang. They came before the hot big bang. So what roughly speaking, the solution is the following. So the solution is that, um, the solution to this problem is that I assume they were, when I wrote this wave equation, so I wrote something that looked like, like this. This is, the, this is inside the horizon. So this is how they behave inside the horizon. So said differently, this is when the physical wavelengths are much bigger than the curvature scale 
of the pro are much so the physical wave numbers are much bigger than the Hubble scale, or said differently, the physical wave lengths are much smaller than the curvature scale of the universe. They look like they're in flat space, and they obey a wave equation like they're in flat space. When you when you extend this equation, so these are so the solutions, so the solutions here are sines and cosines. Now, if instead we look at modes that are much bigger, if we instead just look at modes that are much bigger than the curvature scale of the universe, so there's some Hubble scale here, and we're talking about modes that look like this, then we have to use GR. Like, we're not in a limit where we have good intuition about, about sound waves. And instead, in this limit, the solutions are of the form Or this is a this. So there's there's it's also a second order differential equation. There are also two solutions. One is a constant, c, and the other one goes to zero, like the volume one over the volume of the universe. So this term goes to zero, and then when you match the thing on small scales with the thing on large scales, the coefficient of the signs is matched to this. So b becomes related to d over a cubed which goes to zero. But the cost of doing this is that I had to assume that these modes were already created on extremely long wavelengths, which can have come from local physics. Like, I don't know how I would create these waves. But if I assume they're there, then I can explain why there's no signs. Yep? Uh, why does D over A cube go to zero? Uh, because this is the, this is, A is going to, like, A is going to infinity as the universe gets bigger. This is the volume of the universe. It's big in the past, small in the future. So A is big in the future, small in the past, so B becomes small in the future. Okay, so roughly speaking, if we assume, like even as early as, let's say, just at BBN, somebody handed us some way of generating long wavelength fluctuations that violate local physics at BBN, then just this dilution effect is enough to explain the CMB. But what we don't have is any idea how you make stuff. Like we know how to make sound waves by jiggling something in a room. We don't know how to just create sound waves that have the length of the entire universe. That's when they had to exist. They had to start their life as long wavelength modes. And only through the expansion of the universe can we ex understand why there's these acoustic beats. OK, so that's the key, um, that's the key property of the CMB um, that is tied to the physics of these sound waves. Yep? So, Again, if I put in this, if I put in this, as, so it will work. But now what I have to do is I have to say that whatever this structure is, it's, OK, so first of all, if you measure the distance between these things, they look like the speed of a sound wave. And so you say, for absolutely no reason I can think of, the way in which I generated the amplitude for each sound wave matched exactly what you would expect from this propagation of a sound wave. But yes, you could, in principle, try to do it, to do it that way. Um, in detail, it's, that still won't work because that, that's kind of moving the problem. The, the actual propagation of the sound waves matters. So there are details to do with the fact that it's, you know, it has a velocity and, uh, as well that, that matters. So in detail, that still wouldn't work. But at the level I've drawn it, that's correct. I'm just guessing that that's not a good idea. Yep. Um, just uh, kind of terminology slash definition. What's the relationship between um, a Hubble volume and um, points in causal contact? Um, so you okay? So rough at a given time, the, your ability to communicate in an efficient way is with things that are inside your Hubble volume. But that's not the same as causal contact throughout the history of the universe, because event horizons have to do with ever being in causal contact, not just at some in some finite amount of time. So the intuitive answer is that they're related. That at any given time, things that can talk to each other are inside their Hubble volume, but Usually, we reserve causal contact for uh, for allowing for the past, right? Like things could have been in causal contact that are not currently in causal contact. Um, if that, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So I've used up more of the time than I planned. I was also going to review all of large scale structure uh, in this time period. So um, uh, I will maybe have time to state one more puzzle. Um, that we'll talk about next time to do with large scale structure. Okay, so um, 
Okay, so this is this is the CMB. Okay, so so the CMB is a bunch of sound waves. Um, inflation will ult ultimately be the mechanism that explains why it has this cosine structure. It has nothing to do with the sound waves. Um, but there's a very important useful fact that comes out of this, which is that, that the fluctuations of anything in the universe, let's just say delta rho of any particular quantity, will break up into two pieces. So there'll be this like A of k piece, which encodes inflation. This is the amplitude of all the density fluctuations. Then we'll just call it a transfer function. So this is called a transfer function. This encodes the this is all the hot big bang stuff. And even and then later structure formation, okay? So So the key is that these two things factorize. There's the physics of inflation and there's the physics after inflation. They factorize, and that's part of why we're going to be able to measure things really nicely in cosmology. Because imagine there were a bunch of terms that look like this, not just one. And when I wanted to compute predictions, I had to add them all up and square them, and they interfered with each other. That made it kind of hard to figure out which one was responsible, the physics of inflation or the physics of the Big Bang. But because they factorize, our observables will, will break up into primordial physics from here, and then some function of k that's, determ that's deterministic, determined by the dynamics of some plasma growth of structure, et cetera. So we saw in the case of the CMB, so for the energy and photons, that this transfer function was set basically by a sound wave. The other way in which we measure the universe is by the distribution of stuff at late times. So the distribution of stuff is like density fluctuations at lower redshifts. So the picture, I'm just going to draw the picture and then I'll probably be out of time. So the picture is something like this. We had this sphere and this, just on the surface of this sphere is the CMB. So the CMB is associated with just the outer edge of this, of this sphere. We're sitting in the middle. And then there's like some galaxies and stuff around us. And then it turns into gas as you go out. OK? And so what we've been talking about here is just the temperature on the outside, but there's also all the matter on the inside. So we have three-dimensional distribution of matter. So now this is three-dimensional that also encodes so here I'll put for his thing like this with its own transfer function. Okay, so the matter in the universe is also set by the physics of inflation, the exact same A of Ks with the exact same statistical properties. However, this transfer function is different. So the transfer function here, this is um, this is the matter transfer function. And it looks nothing like the, the CMB. So I'll just draw the two pictures for you. And next time we'll talk a little bit about what, it, what we learned from it. So, so remember, this was our CLs. It looks something like this. Now, OK, it's not going to look as different as it sounds. But the matter power spectrum, the, the one that's related to the transfer function of matter, is a much smoother function. And there's a tiny wiggle on top of this one. There's like a 5% wiggle. So I would characterize this as order one wiggle. And this is 5%, okay? Now, this is an extremely important fact because this physics is supposed to be encoded here. It's this stuff that then becomes this stuff later. But this one is a highly oscillatory thing. And this thing is a not very oscillatory thing at all. This scale here, this big peak in the middle. So this peak here is related to sound waves. This big bump in the middle, this is matter radiation equality. 
So this tells us about which Fourier mode crossed the horizon when the universe had equal parts matter and equal parts radiation. The fact this is a 5% wiggle is what tells you that there's no doubt that there's dark matter in the universe. Okay? If this was made up of baryons, somehow we'd have to move all of this stuff with giant wiggles all the way around the universe to look like this shape. But it's not what it does, it's just a tiny wiggle because most of the universe is made of dark matter. And dark matter doesn't have sound waves. Dark matter has this big, nice feature in it um, that's it's smoothly evolving. And we'll talk about that next. Okay, maybe I'll uh, pause for questions, but we're gonna explain this picture next time. And this will probably, I'm out of time, right? This is a good place to stop? Okay, all right, so questions, yeah. Uh, so we're in the middle because, um, because the photons that were, so this is the amount, this is basically how far a photon can travel from when the universe, so everywhere in the universe, okay, so maybe I should say it this way. There's a slight wiggle to the shape of this thing, okay? Now every point along this surface was at that 0.2 EV. Okay, so what's the, so, this is, we sit in the middle of this because the amount of time it takes light to get to every one of these points is the same. So this is just, be true elsewhere as well, like, so everyone sees, you know, it's like being in the middle of a cloud, right? You see a sphere of white around you and your friend sees a sphere of white around you, but you're not seeing the same sphere of white. Everywhere in the universe looks like this to everyone, right, okay. but, we, but we sit in the middle of this sphere because that's just the sphere of photons that had 13 billion years to get to us. Does that make sense? Okay, other questions? All right, well, I'll let you all take a break, and if you have questions, you, all, you can come talk to me. Hey, I just wanted to thank you for answering all my questions. I know yeah, I have no a lot of those, so no, I that's really fine. appreciate it. Um, I think all of us are feeling a little burnt out. We core of Tassie, so we I understand. appreciate the high I, energy. No, th thank you for asking questions. Yeah, it's no, really, really interesting lecture and very entertaining also. Okay, so thank, thank you. you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, excellent. Um, I had a question on this uh, coastline business. Yeah. Um, so I got a little lost. Um, all right, so you're looking at some kind of correlation between the science and the cosines. Um, and then I kind of got lost how you connected this to inflation and in this oh, statement so, that there so, are no cosines. So basically, the statement that there's sines and cosines is the idea that I made them in the sound, I made the sound waves in the fluid made of sound, right? Like I'm in the room, I'm shaking up the sound waves. The solution to the problem is to imagine the sound waves have existed forever. So basically, or far enough in the past that at some point in the distant past, they're actually bigger than the curvature of the universe. So they weren't behaving like sound waves. They're behaving like these things that are as long as the whole universe. During that period, they don't oscillate and wiggle. One of them goes to zero. One of the two solutions goes to zero. So if you imagine I have a solution at small distances that behaves like a, um, I, I have a, a solution at small distances that behaves like, si like sines and cosines, and a solution that behaves like a constant and a power law that goes to zero, I have to match those coefficients, because they're really fundamentally just one solution to the whole complicated system that starts its life in the very distant past as these power laws, and then only much later turns into sines and cosines. But because one of the constants is gone, I only have one constant in my differential to solve my differential equation. It has to, the phase has to be fixed. It's either, I don't know why it's, I, I can tell you why it's a cosine because it's the one that goes to one as t goes to zero and not the one that goes to zero. But otherwise, that's the only reason it's a cosine. Like the, what, something was going to be fixed because of that process. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, I definitely have more questions on these two guys, but it sounds like you're going to say more I'm about gonna, them. I, yeah, I, so there's a bunch of stuff that was, I'm really just getting started on this. So okay. I'll, I'll talk about that to start next time. Also, the sines and cosines. So, in the in the in the transfer period during the acoustic oscillation, uh, how how well is the oscillation that A and B don't mix? Um, so there's no B. It's like totally zero, as far as we know. But there are things that are generated that look like the. Okay, so so there's not an independent thing that has its own statistics. However, a sign. Okay, there's two situations. So one. A neutrino, and we're going to talk about this later, neutrino can generate B not equals to zero, but correlated to A. 
So you can generate a phase only from neutrinos and only because neutrinos travel faster than the sound waves. We'll get there in a later lecture, so that's one comment. The second comment is that um, there is an effect due to velocity. So velocities are like a time derivative um, by, the, by continuity of mass. And so there are effects that are proportional velocities that are related to signs. So, so, so the neutrinos is from the non-trivial terms to the right. The the other thing is just because we don't directly see the temperature at the surface of blast scattering. We see the temperature today, which is a combination of that and Doppler shift. So if that region is moving away from us, it also changes the temperature. So there's an extra contribution that has a sign in it because it's a velocity term, but that's actually distinguishable from the B that I wrote. The physics of the velocity is different from a sign in the density, but that's like in detail. That's one of those. Like, so the neutrino is only because, yeah, so there's, there's a, that's not a nonlinear term, it's just a linear coupling between, but that, but that one is the extra sources, that's from gravity, from neutrinos. But otherwise, it's like a fact, there's no sign, like that's, the, 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 the fact there's not a sign with a, with, um, is, is like determined by causality. The reason it's only neutrinos is because neutrinos travel faster than the sound speed. So anything that travels slower than the sound speed can never gener regenerate that sign, even if it sits on the right hand side of that equation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, you're wrong. Thank you. I have a quick question about this cosmic variance part of the power spectrum. So I understand that scaling is one over root L, but what, is, what determines the amplitude? I mean, you can scale oh, it's everything. The, no, so it's, it's the power spectrum itself. Okay. So if I, measure, if I measure one mode, my uncertainty on that mode is the variance of the mode itself. Right, so imagine a Gaussian distribution, and I just like randomly.